hopefully last but not least, but definitely shortest. So coming after those, those uh, two talks. Um, I, I, I want to join everyone in, in thanking Utah Valley University for hosting this. I think it's been a, a really interesting thing, thing to see the panoply of views about uh, Justice Scalia. I think particularly after hearing some of today's panel, he might one of his quotes came to mind, which is, a man who has made no enemies is probably not a very good man. And I think Justice Scalia would realize that uh, many of his opinions here are uh, have become lightning rods and are very polarizing, uh, but I think he would say that if you're speaking the truth and you're speaking it uh, boldly, then you are certainly going to make enemies from time to time. So I, I, I think he wouldn't be entirely uh, surprised to hear that this is his, his discussion of his legacy after his passing. Um, and in that light, I'll, I'll just tell you, for, uh, I, I'm going to talk today about his public appearances and Justice Scalia's attempts to persuade the public um, and, and his ability to try to make his case, not simply to uh, the it's in the court and the legal field, but in the, in the public at large. And so um, I'll start with the story of the last, I guess it was quasi-public speaking event I, I saw Justice Scalia at, that at, and that was this past January. And it was in Washington, D.C. at the Dominican House of Studies. It's uh, a major education spot for Dominican brothers to learn. And his, his subject was St. Thomas Aquinas and the Natural Law. And for those who aren't Catholic here, I'll give you maybe a, a, a parallel to, uh, to the LDS uh, church. He, if, if St. Dominic, the founder of the Dominicans, is, is more like Joseph Smith, St. Thomas Aquinas is a little bit to Dominicans, maybe like Brigham Young. He is absolutely revered and, and was obviously a, a pillar of Western thought as well. Um, so for Justice Scalia to walk into a room where he was literally surrounded by Dominican brothers and then a few outside uh, guests, and it was a room like this, but he was state planted kind of in the middle of it, and it was in the round. So they were literally surrounding him. And to stand up and say that Thomas Aquinas basically had it all wrong on uh, natural law, that the angelic doctor himself didn't get it right, and, and at the end of the day, I'm probably a better judge than the St. Thomas Aquinas is anyway. Well, this is someone who certainly, and, and it particularly as a, as a very faithful Catholic himself, to, to challenge a doctor of the church, <laughs> an obviously revered member, he's certainly someone who um, was nothing if not gutsy and bold in all his opinions on the court and off, and he certainly didn't mind picking a fight. So uh, I may not exactly agree with his conclusion in that lecture. I think there's a lot to be said for the natural law in judging, um, and I, 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 I sort of like Thomas Aquinas myself. But uh, his motivation for it is, interestingly, the same motivation that drove a lot of his public lectures and his and engagement with the public about the court, and that is trying to make sure that we have a system of judging and a system of, of enforcing the rule of law that doesn't open the door to subjectivism. He wanted to make sure that there's a, a, an objective standard that judges can look to so that we are ha engaged in a rule of law and not a rule of men, so that the judges themselves, it's not their personal opinions that are ruling, but really the laws, and in, in our, in our uh, society, the laws that are laid down by our democrat democratically elected representatives. So how did he go about making this, uh, his pitch, I guess we could say, to the, to the public on his uh, views. He's not the justice who wrote the most books. That, that title goes to Justice Breyer. Uh, he's not the one who has had the most law review articles, although, um, as, as uh, Professor Murphy mentioned, he has some, had some very influential ones, um, including his rule of law as a law of rules, which continues to rank among the most cited law review articles out there. Um, but I think his attempts to popularize the context of textualism and originalism have truly borne fruit. As those of you who were here for the panel before said, in many ways uh, we can say we are all originalists now. Justice Kagan said this in her confirmation hearings, and she's someone who comes at the law from a very different political perspective, certainly from Justice Scalia, and frankly from a different uh, judicial philosophy. She's not actually an originalist, but I think her point was that everyone speaking about the law and, and particularly in, in, the, in the public and you know, in, in the con judicial confirmation process, has to speak in the language of originalism. And because, because that is, in fact, something that has gained a lot of traction in American society. I think Judge Bork had a lot, of, a lot to do with uh, popularizing that, but I don't think Justice Scalia's influence can be, um, can be ignored. So um, first, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about maybe his own words, at least, in describing why he decided to start uh, talking to people in, in the press. Uh, he, as he describes it, he said originally he pretty much hid in the grass. He said he's more or less a traditionalist, and this is traditionally con common law judges don't go out and talk to the press. Um, I think we've seen more of that lately. I think it's uh, interesting to be able to blame <laughs> Justice Ginsburg's ill-advised ill comments on Justice Scalia. But as he would describe it, he started speaking uh, in, in the public because he wanted people to get words out of his own mouth. There was a lot of vilification going on in the press, and he felt that he wanted them to 
uh, hear from his own mouth what his perspective is so he could make his own case. Um, he said, I don't think I'm going to persuade the whole country, but I do hope I can get the country to understand the difference between the two fundamental approaches to constitutional interpretation. I want to drive out of their mind the notion that what this is on the Supreme Court is a fight between conservatives and liberals. It is not that at all. So uh, contrary, I guess, to uh, Professor Murphy's argument, he, he, he would argue, Justice Scalia would argue, that he is trying to depoliticize the court. What he wants to show is this is not about re Republicans versus Democrats. It's not conservative versus liberal. It's about competing philosophies of what does the Constitution mean and how are we interpreting it. Um, I think some of the one of the best examples of his uh, elucidation of this was a series of debates he had with Justice Breyer, who I guess would be called the leading proponent of the, of the progressive living constitutionalist view, which was, which was um, the, the debate going on. He spoke in, in 2006, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, almost an annual tour they would do and in, in various locations and have debates. Many of them are available on YouTube um, or, or other elsewhere online. So I encourage you, if you want to hear it from the horse's mouths, uh, it's, it's great to be able to hear these debates between Scalia and Breyer. And there are a few re recurring themes in all of these, those of legislative intent and legislative history. So are we looking at the, how do we, how do we determine what, how, what law we're interpreting? Are we trying to get at the intent of the legislators or are we just looking at the text? Do we look at the history, the legislative history? So maybe committee reports or things that were debated on the floor of Congress, things that, that members of Congress may have said during the passage of the legislation or do we look only at the text? Also, at international law, how should this be used in American courts? And then the notion of constitutional evolution. And I think that the theme that ties all of these together, again, is Justice, Justice Scalia's view that our democratic system requires elected representatives to make the law. So we need a system, he would say we need a system that is objective and that actually constrains judges and prevents them from importing their own views into the law. Now, he's not claiming that, that uh, liberal judges are attempting to import their views into law. Maybe there are some, some bad actors out there uh, on either side of the, of the uh, political spectrum who are, but I think for the most part, judges are trying not to. But there are certain types of judicial philosophy that almost invite you to bring in your own rules. Anytime you have a test that's asking you, well, what do you think a reasonable man would do in this case? Everyone always imagines themselves. I'm clearly a reasonable person. And then it, it just invites one to, to bring their own opinions in into. So one test that he, he, I think, would say you could use to see if your philosophy is a sound one and is actually constraining you is, is uh, the one that you'll find on the inside of the program, which is when he said, the judge who always re reaches results he likes is a bad judge. So if you don't run into cases where your philosophy that, you're, that you're, you've laid out is forcing you to choose for someone you think, oh, this is horrible, this is not the person who should win this case, then what you're doing is probably picking and choosing how you're doing it. Maybe you're applying originalism in some cases, but a purposivism in others, and you know, picking and choosing based on the case what, what in interpretive approach you use. Um, and he gave a lot of examples of cases that he'd voted on that he thinks he didn't like the outcome in. So some were constitutional, like the flag burning case. He thinks it's horrible. He wishes people who were burning flags uh, would, would face severe punishment. But he, he said it's very clear the First Amendment protects uh, if anything, it's protect, it was there to protect hostile speech and speech that was, that was politically unpopular and speech that was criticizing the government. And so in, in that's exactly what flag burning is. And so that's why uh, he, w he voted in favor for that, even though he's personally horrified uh, by the notion of people burning flags. He voted in, ma in many cases to block agencies trying to deregulate, even though, as he said, when he was in the administration, he was Mr. Deregulation. He was trying to ke get, get the number of regulations down, but he felt he was constrained by statutes that simply said the agencies couldn't do that. So he came to that result where he, you know, an agency's finally trying to do what he had been begging them to do uh, when he was in government on the other side of the aisle and then uh, the, on the other side of another branch, and now suddenly he's having to rule as a court that he, they can't actually do that. Um, and then uh, he mentions another case where just as a, as a personal matter, he felt it was, it was wrong. It was an Indian Child Welfare Act case where a child had been adopted out to a non-Indian family. And years later, I think, I think it was twins who were maybe four or five years old by the time the case came down, the ruling, it was the law, he said, was clear. But the ruling was that they had to be returned to the tribe, even though their, their parents, who were the, the American Indian members, had, w had consented to the adoption and wanted them adopted. And they were torn away from a family, the only family they had really ever known. He thought, this is just a horrible result. But it's clearly what the what the law says, and this is what I what I have to rule. And he would say, if you if you think you're going to always get to a good result with uh, your your theory of interpretation, that's because you're assuming that 
uh, that Congress has always made good laws, and that's just foolish, which of course all of us know uh, can cite so many examples of laws that are that we think are wrongheaded, and uh, maybe we'd all uh, think of contrary different <laughs> laws. We'd, we'd disagree on which ones are wrongheaded, but we can all certainly agree the legislature gets it wrong a fair amount of the time, and if they get it wrong, it's not the court's job uh, to try to pick up the pieces uh, because our, our representatives are the ones who are the making those laws. Um, so I a couple of those themes I'll, I'll spell out a little bit more. Uh, first, he d the ma first major theme, and this is uh, one of his ways of constraining the judge was talking about do we look at the text or do we look at the purpose of the law? And when you look at his debates back and forth uh, with Justice Breyer, he will uh, he'll talk about the fa the fact that you can't uh, when you're talking about a purpose, it, it depends on what level of specificity you're looking at. So the the reason purposivism is very dangerous and allows the judge to uh, in kind of mold the, the test to get the results they want is because you can state the purpose very narrowly or you can state it very broadly. You could say the purpose of this law, say it's a, it's a civil rights law, but it has certain exceptions in it. Well, you could, you could say that this is the purpose of the law is to advance civil rights, so I want to read the law broadly and read these exceptions narrowly, but just as much text of the law are the exceptions that are included in it. So you can you can draw it small, you know, a, a small level of intent and say, well, their clear intent was the words here, and they said it's going to be all these except for these groups are excluded. But if you want to, if you take it broader and broader, and at the highest level, you could just say these laws are are created to advance liberty and freedom, which at, at the at the end of the day, all of our laws are hopefully aimed at doing. But you can't simply look at it at that level, or, or you're allowed to read into it whatever you think law and freedom means. Um, and in, their, in his back and forth with Justice Breyer, he always would, would say, uh, Breyer would admit, using the purpose of the law isn't legit if you're just using it to import your own, uh, own opinions. Um, you're really just trying to get at what the right purpose is, the right, the right level of specificity for that case. And, and Scalia's retort was, of course, sometimes it's very hard to tell the difference. Uh, y y you may not be attempting to do this consciously, but it's very easy to um, go into this. And it's also very difficult um, then, it, it's, a, it's a job that, that judges aren't well equipped to do. So I, I think one of the most extreme levels of this, um, it becomes in, in, well, let me see, this, this, this quote doesn't go right here. Um, uh, that this should go down later. But so it, I'll, I'll talk then next about legislative history, which fits in the same, in the same section, which is um, that legislative history is a one mechanism that the courts could use to look at, at uh, intent of the, of the legislature. So the text may say this, but we want to know what it means. So we don't look at the general public meaning, which is what Justice Scalia would say. What did, what did, what were these words? What did these words mean at the time that the law was passed? That we'll assume that that's what they mean. But we'll look at the legislative intent. We'll look at maybe statements by the congressman who voted on this. We'll look at what the reports of the committee said, and uh, that is uh, another again subject to this temptation to pick and choose. And he would have said that itself is a legal fiction. There, there are 500 and some members of Congress, right? There is no one legislative intent. You could have one legislator whose intent is different, who hopes they read this phrase broadly. Another who hopes they read this phrase narrowly. Another hopes they forget this phrase altogether. Um, but the non and nonetheless, what they've all voted for and what the president has signed at the end of the day is the law of the United States. And it, it's also dangerous uh, if, we, if we say it's the intent of legislators that, we that governs. Uh, that's not something that the public at large is even able to access. We can, you c if, I as voluminous as our laws are, at least you have access to say, all right, what does the law actually say? What am I bound to do? Um, but it, it, there's, there's no way for you to know what does Senator so and so think I was bound to do when he or she was passing this law in you know 1942 or whatever whenever, whenever it was. And so and it op also opens the go door to gaming and manipulation. So if, if legislators know that you're going to be looking at these texts when you're interpreting the law, in addition to the words, they'll get the they'll put the words in that they can get the votes for. But then they'll put all the other things they wish they could have gotten more votes for into the legislative history. So they can put a, a committee report. You don't have to vote on the committee report. No one can offer an amendment to the committee report on the floor when they're voting on the bill. But they'll they can bring all sorts of statements in, and then hopefully, it, you know, when it the law is, is being uh, litigated later, maybe they can rely on that and get it to say what they wish they could have gotten an actual uh, vote on. Another area that, that came up repeatedly in these debates was international law, and that was another issue of picking and choosing, and, and uh, in it opened the uh, again opens the door for a judge to pick and choose their, their things, and, and Scalia particularly criticized it because there are hundreds of countries in the world First of all, why, why do we care what they say when we're trying to interpret our own constitution? It's Americans that have passed it. It's, an, it, you know, it, it's the, the, our country that it's for. It's in this particular circumstance. It doesn't actually matter what the law in another country is to how our law should be interpreted. Um, 
but he also would say there's no guiding principle. So if you look at cases where the court has cited on it, has cited it, it does tend to be cited um, by the liberals in the court. They'll cite the laws that they agree with and the not the laws that they tend not to agree with. So, for example, in Bowers versus Hardwick, which is an earlier case talking about uh, the right to homosexual activity in which the court ruled and said there wasn't a constitutional right to it, you saw in the dissent citing all these different cases in European law. But, of course, they only cited the laws of the countries that had actually approved this. There, there were many other countries in the world that didn't, and they don't cite those laws. And he, and Justice uh, Scalia would say you could, you could find those, uh, those pro and cons all over, and why do we, and how do we choose which ones we cite? There, it's, it's a, it opens the door. And then finally, the notion of constitutional evolution. So he, the, the, his big beef with the whole thing is the idea that this constitution will mean something different today than it meant yesterday, than it meant for the framers, and that will mean for our grandchildren. Because what the constitution is created to do is, is limit what the government can do, limit the power of the majority. It's actually the majority choosing to limit itself in many ways, because the, the constitution was, a, was ratified and adopted by a majority of the people and can be amended by a majority of the country, by a, a very super majority. But, um, it is, it's the, it is the country that has chosen to limit itself. So there are certain things we can't do. As much as we may like to, we can't, you know, abridge First Amendment rights and, and block f flag burning, et cetera. Um, but to change that, then what you're saying is the people, at the, the, the people of the United States, as when they're erecting their government, um, we're, we're saying we have a government that's going to be designed such that whenever five people on the Supreme Court vote that it's changed, it's changed. No one would have passed, a, 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 no one would have adopted a constitution that said that, that it said, and then it's going, then we're going to create a super constitutional convention of nine people, and whenever they decide that something actually should be modified in this document, it's going to be different. Um, and uh, so what he, he also pointed out the fact that the idea of a constitutional, a constitution evolving suggests, presupposes that the constitution is always, that the society is always evolving in a positive direction. He pointed out societies don't always mature, sometimes they rot. And so he would argue that even if even if it could be shown that society had changed, that doesn't actually argue that we should uh, be able to just change the document without actually doing it in the official way of, of amending it. He also pointed out that a con the, the Constitution is not designed to foster change. It's not, it's not an agent of change. It's actually designed to limit change. So it tells the government what it may not do. You can legislate on all sorts of things, but you can't uh, ha limit freedom of religion. You can't abridge the right to bear arms, et cetera. Um, and then finally, he also criticized the court because in many cases where they claim to be evolving the Constitution, it is not even, even you know, if you, if you th say maybe there is a way the court can determine which way the, this, the society is evolving. Maybe they can look at public opinion polls. Maybe they can take a survey. Maybe they can look at how many states have decided on how to do which kind of laws. Um, in many cases, the court isn't even doing that. So there are cases in which they appeal to constitutional evolution but go with uh, the decision of a minority of states. So, for example, in Atkins versus Virginia, a case dealing with the execution of mentally, the mentally ill, uh, only 18 of 30 states, 36 states outlawed it, and the court went with the minority. So, uh, so they're clearly not reflecting cons the, the societal change. They're actually leading societal change, and that, and that is certainly not what the court's doing. Furthermore, uh, the court is not, is not an elected body, right? So that would be his, his fundamental um, uh, concern. And he, and he pointed out to that this is a novel idea in American jurisprudence. So, for example, uh, take the women's right to vote. Uh, when the 19th Amendment was passed, we already had the 14th Amendment. We already had equal protection under the law is guaranteed. I think if you had the question nowadays, many people would say, well, equal means equal, and it must mean that women have the right to vote too um, because, you know, that's what equal protection means. But if you, if you were looking at what it meant at the time it was passed, I, don't, I, I think it's clear that they, the, the framers of that amendment didn't think they were giving the women the right to vote. That's why we had the women's suffrage movement and, and went to the, the, the trouble of having an amendment, and I think that was the right way to do it. And when there are major uh, significant changes in American society that require uh, constitutional change, I think that's, that's the way we do it. And Scalia I, also has stated that he, he wishes it was a little easier to pass an amendment just so people would do that. So finally, was Justice Scalia successful in, in – uh, persuading people in his, in his goal. He specifically said he didn't uh, expect to win cases. That was not his goal. He wasn't expecting to be the Bill Brennan on the court that was going to be able to make deals. Um, he, his goal was uh, not, he says, my hope is not to be influential, it is to be right, to be faithful to my oath, which is to apply the Constitution. Uh, he, wanted to, he said he wanted to educate people about the differences. I, I'm not sure how well he, he succeeded necessarily in that. A, a Gallup poll in 2015 showed that 
32 percent of the people even weren't even familiar with who he was. <laughs> and many, uh, another 2013 poll showed that 20 percent of people thought that he was the swing vote on the court, not Anthony Kennedy. In fact, he was on the far edge of the court. So, you know, it, yeah, I'm not sure people necessarily know who, who he is or that he's reached the entirety of the American public by, by a long stretch. But I think polls in polls you do s consistently see that I around 50 percent of the people do espouse the kind of originalism that Justice Scalia advanced. And I think that that is a real accomplishment because that wasn't certainly the predominant judicial philosophy for a long time on the court. Um, when asked if he thought he was crying out in the wilderness and losing the argument, he said he, he sometimes he feels like he's Frodo climbing up the, the hill of Mount Doom. Um, but he, he doesn't actually think that he has uh, failed. He just he th says, I don't worry about my legacy. Just do your job right. And so I hope that um, uh, I, I think that he's, he, is in his own mind, was able to live up to that. And I, I think he's done his job very well. And one final comment is I, I think his final impact on the, pu the public's view of the court will have been the fact that he left his, his uh, vacancy in an election year, certainly not the timing he would have chosen. But it, that in and of itself, uh, while not hit by his choice, has done something to really vault this issue into the public consciousness because um, his vacancy, even though I think many people, court watchers, have known for a while the next president will likely have two or three spots open on the court, um, just given the age of the, of the current justices, the fact that there's one staring us in the face brings the import of the next uh, justice really clearly in front of us. And we have candidates that have staked out very, uh, very different territory on the Supreme Court. We have, have Trump, who is actually one of the first candidates um, that I know of in history to give a list of their, their Supreme Court justices, including uh, Utah Supreme Court uh, uh, Justice Tom Lee, who I've, who I've met and is a, is a wonderful justice, and a lot of other uh, state court judges as well as federal judges, all of whom actually have clear evidence of espousing these principles uh, that Justice Scalia stood for. We have Hillary Clinton, who has uh, repeatedly stated she wants people who will overrule Citizens United, which I think is more about it's securing First Amendment rights to everyone regardless of whether they're in a, a corporation or, or a partnership or however they choose to organize themselves, not, not about trying to uh, <laughs> enable corporations to take over the world, as some people suggest. She talked about wanting to have case, uh, a court that's going to be very strong on upholding the right to abortion. Uh, she's been very critical of religious freedom opinion. She's been very uh, excited about the president's immigration action, other broad executive actions. So those are the kind of things she talks talk about wanting to have courts um, uh, emphasize going forward. So I think there's a really... Um, it's going to be a, a, that one of the most important uh, debates about the Supreme Court we're going to see is, is hopefully will come up in the debates uh, at, that we'll see shortly. And uh, Justice Scalia was concerned to see that, the, that, that confirmation hearings had become so politically, but by his re but political, but in his reading, it was specifically because courts have taken on to themselves a role of being a, a politician more than a judge. When you have a judicial philosophy that invites your policies into the courtroom, um, that that makes it fair game, he, w he said, to open up and discuss those uh, in a judicial confirmation process. So while he wishes we'd, we all judges were like him and, and tried to put their politics in the, on the back burner when they're deciding cases, um, I, he said that as long as we have a system where judges are substituting their, their politics um, for the actual text and history of the Constitution before them, uh, we're, gonna ha we're going to see that going forward. So um, with that, we'll, we'll go to questions.